This is a free Wild World podcast. This is the first podcast in a new series of podcasts I'm doing, and this one we're doing from the chairs in the creaky. I'm going to try and sit still. It's a bit echoey. We're in a bit big, empty room. But uh, it is what it is, and I'm above Gallery 111 in Loop Street in Cape Town. And this is Jan, Jan Kreer, right? Yes. He's also a Cape Townian, so in the inner city, the beautiful inner city of Cape Town, it's been raining a lot. And for the first time in probably weeks, I don't know how many weeks, we have three days in a row of sunshine. So I know. We have all very good mood, I'm a good mood. It's almost like springtime. <laughs> exactly. It's but like not yet spring, because Joburg is full of snow. Yeah, exactly. We blessed it. It's snowing there in Cape Town, we're in the lovely city of Cape Town, which is one of the best places to be on planet Earth. So, for, before I start chatting to Jan, I'm going to tell you about my new project that's starting. Well, I have many projects, but the new exciting one, considering vlogs and podcasts, is at the end of the month, I'm going to go on a bit of a walkabout again. I'm aiming for the West Coast, I'm not sure, but I'm starting a new series of vlogs, podcasts, and interviews. And it's going to call, be called Walk the Earth. I'm going to title something here now. And uh, I just want to go to places and towns and just speak to whoever wants to speak to me. Any guy, any person, any lady, the story, let's talk. And I'm going to record towns and put up vlogs. And if you're in a small town and you think you have an interesting story, an interesting town, and you want to host me, I'll come there to do a music gig. Um, come do podcasts and vlogs about your town and uh, yeah, just give me a call, contact me. Okay, so I'm talking to Jan and Jan is, I met Jan in Cape Town when I did a John Bauer installation at his Cafe Racer, which is a restaurant. Mm. So Jan, let's uh, talk about you now, enough about me and my wow. stuff. So uh, what is your, uh, what, what is your claim to fame? What do you, what, how, how do you identify? What mm. do you, what are you? Claim to fame. So it is a claim to fame, just say, who are you, what do you do? Um, I'm not going to try to sound too hippie, okay. um, human, I think I identify, some days I don't want to. Um, I think if you were to put it in a nutshell, a claim chef, um, years ago, and uh, um, yeah, sort of went with, uh, with life and culture um, to bring people interesting experiences. Uh, through food, through um, you know, getting together, interesting spaces, um, and uh, and creating a memory um, and a culture around that, um, and then combine it with food and things like that. So um, yeah, that's uh, in a nutshell. Where things uh, where things go, and then the rest the rest of the magic happens when uh, when the like-minded people meet up in in the space, and uh, I just do like the sort of the formality of have you met this, have you met that, have you met this, and then these little connections all happen. Okay, so you're creating a space around food, and then things like that. It's like a little movie playing yeah, in front of you. Exactly, it's like a little playhouse theatre almost. Um, with, uh, with the public space and uh, the space is uh, for some people and the space is uh, not for some people and the space means this to some people and the space means something else to other people. So you just let the world unfold in front of you and give them f full bellies and, uh, and a couple of drinks along the way with uh, with the common denominator of unlimited Wi-Fi, which we live in today. Yeah. So that's the important thing, being glued <laughs> to the cell phone. So now, of course, like, I'm such an addict to uh, YouTube and everything online now, but I mean, this is the world we live in now. Yeah. But before we get to that... Information world, yeah. Yeah, I love it. But before we get to that, let's start from the start, and now we know who you are, so a little bit of a backstory. Uh, as much as you want to tell, we grew up, uh, how did you reach this point we are now in your life. Yeah, so I mean, um, well, there's a good and a bad. Maybe there is a always a good and a bad, but uh, um, it all takes you somewhere. Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, lived in Israel for three years, um, and uh, that sort of came about because my father said that uh, I can't, uh, can't stay in the house anymore uh, because I didn't want to study. 
after school. So uh, <coughs> about two months, three months later, of uh, a lot of body. Uh, what age was this? 18, yeah. Okay. Very young. So, um, and then my father was like, uh, listen, I'll get you a ticket, a uh, return ticket. You choose wherever you want to go. And I'll give you, not lots of money, but I'll give you some money. And then you go do your thing, but you ain't doing it yet. So, uh, so that was like a sort of a gentle nudge. And then I ended up in Israel of all places, um, family German background. Um, um, ended up in Israel because I, a few of my mates had gone on like a year's uh, sort of trip or a couple of months trip or whatever. Never met up with a friend, ended up in Israel. Uh, ended up on a kibbutz. I was shoved into the kitchen uh, cooking for I think Mahavia, which is the name of the kibbutz. Uh, I think it had 650 people living on there, like a little oh, micro, oh. like a little micro social uh, society, mm -hmm. which is quite cool. Uh, like Stalin without the Stalin, kind of thing. <laughs> um, and uh, so yeah, everyone has to perform a job or a purpose. Um, to sort of uh, create glory to the commonwealth. Um, and uh, so I was put in the kitchen, and uh, it's three meals a day, breakfast, lunch, dinner. Um, and uh, yeah, I wouldn't say that's where I sort of learned my passion for cooking, or identified it. Uh, I identified that I was good at it. Um, and then, uh, yeah, like I said, the good and the bad part. Uh, at the same time, I was also a part professional sperm donor. Um, Israel needed some fresh... Are you, are you literally or figuratively? No, no, literally. <laughs> I was paid uh, equivalent in rands. I was paid 800 rand every third day. Yeah. For that time, I mean, for yeah. that age, that is exactly. good. So, uh, and I'd go to the clinic and do my donation anyway. But I mean, there was a story behind it. They needed. Uh, How does it work, though? Is it do they, they test your, your sperm count? The uh, actual thing? Do you have to yeah, go you have to go to a little cup. Go to a cubicle, yeah, and get magazines, yeah, yeah. and you go to the clinic. Uh, they give you your little cup. You're obviously registered, and every now and again, they still check that your sperm count is, uh, is where it's supposed to be. Um, they needed that in terms of the the Israeli nation, uh, I think, you know, not saying it's a bad thing, but I think from a lot of uh, inbreeding over many years, really? um, they had something called Tazax, which was, uh, you could have Tazax uh, and still function as a normal human being, but if two people have that in their bloodline, they cannot reproduce. <coughs> so anyway, so as a project, they identified that they needed fresh DNA, and uh, into the bloodline, and, uh, and yeah, so I, uh, that was sort of the part-time part. Ended up staying in Israel for, instead of a couple of months, I stayed for three years, um, and uh, then went to a, a culinary school. I could speak Hebrew at the time. Um, I went to a culinary school in Tanmor, um, and did my practical part of my studies there. I couldn't do the tertiary part because I couldn't write, uh, Hebrew. Um, so then when I came back to South Africa, then I finalized it here, did the tertiary part here, and then, yeah, then jumped into, uh, into professional cooking. So you saw from a young age, which I never did, I always, always missed to I say like to cheers. Yeah, cheers, thanks for being here. And uh, so you from a young age, you knew it was cooking, and then you went for cooking. For me, it was like, I'm still like, I'll do other things. I yeah. just can't focus on one thing. Right? I think it wasn't really that, I mean, in terms of my peers or in the industry, it was very, I mean, I was identified as that I was good at it. Yeah. So therefore, it became a purpose. So, um, and, you know, for years, you would uh, chase your own tail, chase your ego, um, type of thing. So, um, after working, in Johannesburg at uh, quite a few good hotels. Um, then I got an opportunity to come down to the winelands, uh, 96 Winery Road, uh, to take over the kitchen for a seasonal period. And then I ended up staying, yeah. Um, so yeah, and then was in the fine dining game for, for some time. Um, and uh, 
yeah, ended up getting divorced through the process as well. Hence that bad part. Um, and then moved away from cooking completely. So closed down my last restaurant. Um, and uh, yeah, then uh, I, via the sort of grapevine, ended up, uh, I think more out of boredom. Um, ended up uh, at Solutions Youth Institute, which is here in town, at their outreach program. So we, we, we would go to uh, um, little groups, like in Hout Bay, Langa, Pugaletu, Kailicha, uh, and uh, sort of skills development and uh, social upliftment. Um, and I did that for probably about six months. Um, and then I identified with a group in Kailicha and they got uh, land, uh, I then not moved away from solutions, but I went on doing my own, my own thing. Um, got land from the city of Cape Town, uh, in Kailicha, spent the next year and a <coughs> half uh, building a community centre there, um, from which they run uh, um, workshops. Um, and, uh, and then yeah, finally, <coughs> I think probably after a good, two and a half, three year process of not being involved in, in restaurants then, uh, and deliberately not wanting to chase my own ego again. Um, our opportunity came along as they had done throughout the whole period and uh, I made the decision that if I was going to do something in terms of food again and or restaurant culture, it would be something that was to my taste and uh, showcasing who and what I am and what I like and you know ever evolving so it's not like a stagnant little thing and then food would be a complement to that in the same version of where it's not necessarily only a standard menu the whole day every day every year every this that uh, um, that yeah that uh, it would be more uh, experience of oh, this spam that calls me sorry everyone um, and uh, and then yeah, and then that is where so the brand of the Cafe Racer started back in Somerset West uh, about eight years ago, and uh, um, yeah, we lived there. Obviously, I have a, uh, I have a son there, a beautiful blessing of my life, and uh, yeah, so I had Cafe Racer there in Somerset West, then moved down to Strand, closer to the beach. Uh, we I had it there for a number of years as well and then um, a mixture of personal and COVID and everything else um, then I made the decision to finally as I've wanted to all along never knowing when um, come through to the centre of, of Cape Town uh, we have never lived before uh, I just always when I came to Cape Town I felt it out for some reason um, and we be enough in the city. I even feel more enough that I'm not really a suburban, a suburban child. So uh, the hustle and the bustle and the people and the interesting and the good and the bad and the ugly um, all makes up for a reality that I like. So. Yeah, this the movie is just more intense. It's what's a, what I like about the inner city because I've lived here many years ago just for a month in Long Street. That was a nightmare. Too busy and too loud, never slept. And now I'm like just off on the street and on the fourth floor of a building. Now it's great because when I'm in my little room, I'm on my own, yeah. there's no noise. But when you walk out in the street, this this intense movie is just playing out. Like yeah, said, life is just I love it. In yeah. yeah, and it's like all kinds, all classes. And it's almost like a movie ticket, but you don't buy the ticket. So you yeah. don't know what you're going to see. And you can interact. What you're going to experience, but yet the movie is there, type of thing. And, uh, so, lot, and the interaction is cool because exactly. I, I just like to walk out and just go in the two doors. Yeah. Yeah. So what's what's going on here? Uh, that interaction is great. But I want to okay. So we've got the general gist of your story, but I want to go back now and I want to know first of all that you over did you train were you self taught like in the restaurants kind of? No. Or did you go for? The <coughs> no, no. I did. Uh, I did my my culinary uh, if you could call it a degree. Um, and then uh, after that, I uh, understudied. Um, so you sort of choose your field, almost like a doctor, I would say. Um, not that I want to be medical in 
heavy shaper capacity. So you specialize in a chef? Yeah, so you, 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 you qualify as a chef and then you have to specialize where do you want to go in terms of what type of cuisine, uh, if you want to do pastry, if you want to do French, uh, French whatever. So I chose uh, French um, and uh, so that was at a, I don't think they, they're still training, but for many years uh, they were um, hailed as the top traditional French restaurant in South Africa, which was, which was, uh, which was called Ile de France. And I then uh, very formally wrote a letter um, to, uh, to the establishment and, uh, and requested that I could uh, come in as I understand. And then um, they contact, contacted me and uh, I came in for an interview or a meeting and uh, it was quite comical. I mean, uh, so the chef, uh, Mark Hubert, um, typical, typical French, uh, very, very good at what, it, uh, what he does um, and uh, insane kitchen. He said to me that, uh, so after obviously the letter that I dropped off, uh, he said uh, he's uh, made the decision that I can't come through and, uh, and, uh, and train um, uh, and understand under him, uh, but just be sure I'm not going to pay for this. So, uh, <laughs> it's a privilege. And, uh, yeah, and it, 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 it yeah, is. That, that, that's what it was. And, uh, and long story short, it's not like he didn't pay me. I mean, <coughs> he didn't pay me much. Um, he paid me maybe enough money to. Uh, uh, for, for petrol um, to, to go to work and, uh, and back. Um, so anyway, yeah, so that I did for um, about 18 months and, and obviously working working from, so the first day, you know, I had my little shift jacket with my little buttons and, you know, my own knife set and, you know, I'm ready now to go into the kitchen. So he sat me down in a, in a sort of an open area and there was a, uh, there was a, a, a walk-in fridge uh, a door um, there and there was a singular chair. So in this little area, like a half wall, like this almost. And there was the chair as where I'm sitting now and the fridge door was over there. So he said, come, come, come. And then he said, no, sit here. So then you see the whole kitchen. So uh, the kitchen, yeah, I mean, it was different departments. I mean, absolutely insane. Uh, so like a lovely kitchen? Like proper, like, but insane, like compact. Um, different departments, different things, different whatever. So, and then you have the pass in front. So yeah, it's yeah, a dating program. Of course, oh, because uh, you know, coming in, I think I'm the shit. You know, like uh, <laughs> um, you know, like that type of thing. And uh, so anyway, so he sat me down and said, "I'll be with you now." Just uh, and then went off and fucking instructed. Yeah, da 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 da. So I'm sitting. So I meet the two ladies behind me. They're in a different area. Like they, they in the pastry section. Uh, over there, so we, we sort of chatted a little bit, and uh, so he comes back and he opens up this door, this fridge door, and uh, I mean, I don't know if people from current day would still remember this, back in, in our good old days, um, dustbins were round, <laughs> they had these metal handles. No wheels? Yeah, no wheels. <laughs> so, but this one, um, these ones had, so he had obviously had someone make these circular things with these wheels, almost like these office chairs type things that could move. So everywhere. he started the thing. Yeah, so, um, and then he opened up his door and fucking next moment I'm still sitting here and he's just pulling out these bins huh? on wheels and I'm like sort of stopping them as I, as I go. And these things were filled with vegetables, so from like courgettes to carrots to baby potatoes, whatever. And, uh, um, and then he says, okay, now you start. Um, yeah. I'm like, start fucking what? And he's like, so I prepped, uh, I prepped veg, you know, this is now coming from my pedestal of like, I'm the shit. Did nothing. Um, and I prepped, prepped veg for probably about two weeks, um, if not longer, uh, day in, day out, literally from the time I come in to the time I leave at night. And uh, prepped veg, and then obviously you see the operations of the actual kitchen around. Um, and, uh, and then from then, Department, 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 you know, and you, you sort of, uh, not sort of, uh, very harshly and, and uh, patiently, you learn uh, the practical skills of your, of your trade. So to give you an example, like, I mean, the borderlays that we would serve there would 
probably cook between four and five days um, on a slow cooker, like a stone, stone top cooker. What is border laser? Just explain that again. So border laser is basically like a red wine reduction. Um, Don't we go French thing? It's red wine, red, it's, imagine a gravy, yeah. just with a lot more sort of vegetable extracts. A jus type of wine. And, uh, hey? It's like a jus type of wine. It is a, a, a jus um, type of wine, but I mean, in terms of your reduction and your meat bones and your, your marrow, uh, your marrow bone, I always have to sort of second guess myself because I, um, it's, it's bad to say marrow or bone marrow. Okay. Because then people think like it's a fucking human. Like, <laughs> marrow, <laughs> marrow, <laughs> so, marrow bone. Um, and then obviously uh, very fatty and it needs slow, slow, slow cooking with things being added every day. So the type of scenario in terms of when you're taught in terms of planning of cooking, um, it's not like in, in today's world where everything, you know, fresh is, is king type of thing. You know, like I'm literally going to slaughter the turkey, smoke it in front of you, and then the bread is coming out of the oven, and then, you know, I'll make you a sandwich. Um, you know, French cooking is, uh, time. is, uh, is time consuming and it's planned. Um, so, you know, running an a la carte restaurant, um, and I mean, Ile de France wasn't sporadically busy, it was fully booked. You're the best guy every, in the country. So. Every single day. How many colors? So, and it's, no, while well, you're talking, probably on weekends, you'd probably turn the tables twice. Mm -hmm. So you'd look, dinner service would probably be about between 120 and 180 people. Um, all a la carte. A la carte meaning order from the menu. So it's not set. Such and if you can have this. So, and then um, next to it, so which made it the, the traditional French restaurant. Um, which is still sort of like a bane to my existence. You know, every uh, fucking time you'll probably meet some of them on the west coast as well. Uh, every time Sunny or Susan, um, no, never mind the cooking part. They, there's an understanding in terms of a French or, or the South African version where the name bistro means small, okay. um, but it's not. It's a bistro is you would have similar in French. Cuisine, the word restaurant is French. Yeah. So this is formal dining, restaurant. Bistro is the casual version of formal dining. So, um, so Ile de France had a bistro <coughs> in the same parking area. Um, so you would, your casual dining would be there with a separate kitchen and your formal dining is in the restaurant. So, um, so yeah, I mean, you know, you get to, you get to learn in terms of cooking that there is a right way and a wrong way. There is no in-between way. So when I see a Jamie Oliver chopping up fresh chilies and chucking it in a rocket salad, um, not that I, I hate Jamie Oliver necessarily, but it's, it's, not, it's, it's not conducive in terms of cooking. So French cuisine is all about sauces, so Béchamel, which is your basic way. White sauce, so which calls me white sauce, that. White sauce. And then how you make the roux. Um, you know, I mean, I still to this day feel guilty when I'm, I'm making a bechamel sauce with uh, with a whisk because uh, if Mark were to see me, he'd can have my he'd have my nuts. So um, very controlling and safe. Yeah. So you know, wooden spoon, wooden ladle, uh, brass uh, so sauce pots, and you know, a lot of effort. So and making things like hollandaise and bernays. You know, Basically. French French cuisine without sauce is, is nothing. What I want to get to is those days ago, it's a French, your first restaurant is French, it's very much rule based, this is how I do it, this is how you don't do it. And then, I mean, the last I don't know, 20 years, maybe even 30 years, it became this rock star, chefs became these rock stars, and everybody started to do whatever they wanted to do. Yeah, what they turned in. Fusion. Fusion. Yeah. So, which is like a very shit version of a, of a food concept now. Um, but back in the day, it was, uh, it was the thing. So, where you would take something traditional and you would either combine it with new and interesting things, bringing Asian flavors and pairing them with, with French and whatever. And then, so the birth came about of what you would then turn fine dining, 
where you would literally go for a creative food experience. When did that start fine dining? Like, I think, I mean, Ile you know, de France in its own right was fine dining. I mean, you'd go with, you could only go with a, a blazer and you would need to be formally dressed and, and things like that. And obviously the table's laid formally and service and, and all of those sort of things. Um, but in terms of fine dining, um, uh, you would uh, you would not serve numbers of that uh, capacity, and uh, um, and you would be very creative. So the client necessarily wouldn't um, wouldn't re be returning for the same meal or dish as what they had there before. Um, and I mean, in South Africa, sort of still is, I think, frowned upon because um, it would be deemed as only for the foreign uh, visitors, like the tourists, uh, because financially, you know, it. they can afford it. I mean, to give you an example, I mean, I used to sell a singular plate of food 10 years ago um, for 600, 650 rand. So, you know, looking back at today, I'm not saying that people have become poor or become... I just think you have a lot more creative people um, out and about. Um, so, um, so food, has, food and, and dining has, has evolved that I could go or we could go down the road and find uh, around the corner that we'd probably find like a, a little niche uh, chocolate factory, like a chocolatier. Uh, that is insane. It <coughs> doesn't matter if it's with CBD or without or whatever the case may be. I'm going to be just from here as well. So, you know, um, you know, you find these little, it's no longer the, 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 the sort of period of where if it's our anniversary or if it's a birthday or if it's a celebration, we go to X. You could go to a variety of places. I mean, a little sandwich shop could have the most creative uh, um, person and or combinations. Uh, of what, we, what is being offered and you're going into to areas of, you know, vegan, which has become uh, a lifestyle, no longer just a weirdness. You know, back in my time of professional chefing, um, there would always be the standard joke of like, so what do you have on your menu uh, for vegetarians and you would have for some fuckery that everyone <laughs> had. No, no, God, that's too complicated. No, uh, it would be penne pasta uh, rolled in basil pesto. That's it. Literally. On, that would be a vegetarian option that would be, I mean, nationwide available. Like, and you'd have vegetarians going, fuck so it's, I mean, like, it's, not all I can you know, it's every like, fucking time. It's like, oh, oh, you can have the pasta and go to the salad bar and, and sort of choose from there. So things have moved on, and, and, and obviously, I think in general, sort of culture, coming back to, you know, uh, personalities <coughs> like, uh, Gordon Ramsay and uh, Jamie Oliver and I mean I would obviously miss a, a massive variety of, uh, of these very uh, talented individuals. Um, cuisine was brought to the home yeah. um, where you could watch shows for the theatrical but still learn um, the actual details of how to cook and how to prepare it. Now, for the normal person, yes, you could cook a Gordon Ramsay recipe um, that you saw on TV and you could save it on your device or whatever the case may be. It will still probably take you four hours and you'll fuck it up. Uh, but it is there available. So the more that you watch these things, even if it's for entertainment value, the more they become, people become more cultural or cultured with food and what their choices are of what they want to put in into their body. So like, you know, prime example, I was actually looking at it yesterday. So, um, weirdly enough, and it's a, it's a craziest, craziest thing. In South Africa, um, you, what, what South Africans would call a wrap um, is an actual factor to a tea. Okay. okay. So, it sounds um, good. Right? Yeah, flour and water, and then, you know, I think South Africans call it a wrap because you wrap it and fold it or whatever the case may be. So, that, that's basically to tea. So that's <coughs> yeah. So, um, and it is, it's not basically, it is a tortilla. So, what a tortilla is, is, is it's uh, for packaging purposes and actually, you know, uh, manufacturing. Um, it's pot, it's pot cooked. Um, 
you know, and then it's refrigerated and it's, you know, when you buy it in a packet, it's refrigerated and it's got the little, uh, uh, little plastic things to separate so that the tortillas don't stick together. And then, but for some reason, somewhere, the simulation of the universe left out the part to South Africans that a tortilla is not fully cooked. What you buy no. in the packet is not fully cooked. And yet you find companies like uh, Woolworths, Spa, Pick and Pay, they would still sell you pre-made, like let's give an example of sweet chili chicken wrap, or so on the label it's wrapped. But the fucking thing is not cooked. So that so wrap is actually uncooked. Cooked. This is fucking raw dough that you're giving <laughs> someone and you're putting a filling inside. So the joke um, is on them. Yes, yeah, so well, I mean, and, and it's Africans consume it that way. They believe that this, this is how is, it should be. This is how it should be. Whereas if you just <laughs> go, I mean, if you go to a normal a Mexican where tortillas obviously come from, if you go to a, a Mexican restaurant, the tortilla would always be dry grilled because it still needs to be cooked. Um, wow. It's only pork. Now that you mention it, it's, it's like, like and, and so people eat and they go, it's a like doughy, it's like raw. Because you're eating fucking raw tortillas. And so um, they made millions and millions of yeah, raw it's, it's, it's crazy. And, and you know, no one's bothered to actually like just add that little bit of information. Go, no, I wouldn't want to see this book. Yeah, or even <laughs> take the take the wrap. Yeah. Um, already with filling inside. Um, and just fucking cook it in a pan. It seems this is a beautiful um, opportunity. Somebody should yeah, do that. How to cook, how to cook <laughs> your pre-made or pre-bought <laughs> wrap from? I mean, and it's and it's crazy. It's uh, it's crazy how so many people um, can get uh, something so simple, so wrong, and believe it to be the norm uh, type of thing. So uh, um, yeah, it's a it's an interesting world in terms of cuisine today, and. Uh, and even people that are not formally trained, um, I mean, if you look at smoke houses in, in, in New York and things like that, it is, I mean, it's mental. Uh, the sort of the, the, the machines that they build to sort of smoke their briskets or their, uh, cook their pastrami's. You know, prime example again. So pastrami uh, is meant, traditionally meant to be eaten warm as you would almost have like roast beef on a carvery. Um, and, uh, and globally it is served warm. In South Africa it's served as a cold meat. Um, so you could buy slices of pastrami. But if you ask anyone, you know, for warm pastrami, they're like, what are you talking about? Like, you know, huh? But do you think, I think there's anything you do, it's like at a certain point we're wrong, it's not wrong anymore, it becomes right. Now it's just this. It's sort of like a niche. So, you know, it's, it's exciting what's happening in, terms of food and it's, it's exciting from, a, from a, um, a chef's point of view along with the client because previous years you know you would blow clients away by your creations um, and, uh, and they wouldn't even if they enjoyed it they wouldn't have include what they ate why they ate it why it tasted so good or, or anything else like that now you can actually explain to people that instead of seasoning for instance like I mean in terms of uh, um, uh, the meat at the at the shop, I don't season with with raw salt. I season with soy sauce because it's a lot more gentler. It's a lot gentler on, on raw meat than what you know raw salt is. Um, so uh, um, and it does make for a different Thanks. outcome. So like imagine you, know, <coughs> you go to the industrial area and we go have uh, a Russian chips. Uh, experience. You will always find that there's one lady or one guy running, they're all selling Russian chips, but the one's queue is always, longer. you know, longer and more consistent. Not that the other ones don't make money, but there's one that's always, and you know, if you actually get to the crux of the matter, it's like because he or she or they, you know, they've got this like crazy like secret sauce, you know, and it's just like, I don't know what it is about it. Like you, you ask people like, what, what is the sauce? Like, what is it made of? And they're like, I don't know, it's just like, it's delicious, it's like, it just works, type of thing. So, um, and that's the, the, the world we live in today with, uh, with cuisine. Um, and, uh, and it's beautiful because you get to meet, uh, there is no more right and wrong, there is no more, um, I think traditional cooking is sort of making a comeback. 
because it's become so rare. Fusion has just taken over uh, everything. And if people ask me, like, you know, what what type of chef you are, then I would say um, French trained, but uh, but continental. Continental meaning that I take, you know, inspiration and ingredients from from many different corners of the world, and I infuse them into creations that are not necessarily, you don't go out for uniqueness, but for flavor and crunch and texture profile. Um, where, uh, and, and it's beautiful, you know, food trucks, those type of things, you know, we, it's a completely, completely different world. Um, I remember when I was um, sous chef at uh, Rosebank Hotel back in Johannesburg, massive, massive operations. I mean, we'd, we'd, you'd, you'd sort of do stock take for two days, you know, underground. In the, the underground tris, the, the freezers and, and, and things like that, and you'd go with special jackets and gloves because you wouldn't be able to stay there for for an amount of uh, a, a period of time. But uh, um, you know, those are the days when we used to cook, um, you know, scrambled eggs for uh, you know you'd have the buffet breakfast, and you'd cook scrambled eggs for you know like. 400 to 600 people. That's huge before yeah. break. And, and, and you'd, you'd like pour milk and cream and, and lard into the eggs and it's just sort of like mix it with this massive ladle and then it goes into this big dish of bakery and it's like slopped going up. Um, whereas, um, you know, in today's world, um, you know, even a simple thing like poaching the egg and poaching it good and right and then infusing that water with flavor um, makes for a, a completely unique uh, dish on its on its own. I mean, I come from an era where we used to like for banqueting, we used to cut off the top of pineapples and use that as garnish. Can't get away with it. Yeah, you have that, and, you, and you cut the, the tomatoes into little uh, rosettes and, and the carrots. And, uh, Everybody was very impressed. Yeah, I don't know if it was meant to be a porcupine or whatever the case may be. Um, but, uh, um, and I think along with that, uh, I think our, um, our supermarkets or our outlets um, have become more pressured to provide uh, consistent, fresh, good quality ingredients. Um, you know, back in our day, you know, you'd want vegetable, uh, you choose a packet. Uh, it's, yeah, but but it's, it's, but is, it, is it the packet with the peas and the, the cube carrots or are you buying with the frozen beans? Um, you know, it was all in, in, in vegetables were kept in the chest freezer. Uh, <laughs> I still you know, hate frozen yeah. vegetables. So you, uh, whereas today, you know, um, you know, even fruit vendors and uh, fruit and vegetable vendors and, and big corporations like Woolworths, um, you know, they, uh, they pressure to provide consistent um, uh, produce. Uh, they might not always be, I mean, we can head into a field of genetically modified now. Um, that's but, that's uh, a whole podcast. That's a different podcast altogether, so I'm not saying that those things are good for you, but there is an availability mm. of, uh, of the normal person at home um, trying out things that they would never, they would never be not part of their culture, They've, they weren't raised with it, it was never introduced into their lives naturally like, uh, you know, oyster sauce as an example, like, you know, I can tell you about oyster sauce and you'll be like, I've heard about that before, but like now you can go to Woolworths and for 45 round, you can buy a little bottle of oyster and you can like be that... But the thing is, people are educated now. Yeah, the, the more you educate people, the more you can go on the phone and you go, okay, oh fuck, okay, this is what that is type of thing. Whereas, as I said, back in the day, um, you know, people are just, uh, you went out to dine for an absolute, almost like a naked experience. Um, because it's something that you physically, like if I were to cook uh, confit duck for you, like you can make it at home. It's yeah. going to take you fucking days. Yeah. Um, so you're going to pay me a lot of money because I already have the confit duck. And, and these things come from preventive <coughs> methods and, and the reason why they stood the sort of test of time. Um, Things like foie gras, which is a very taboo subject, force feed. Uh, uh, I wish people like, would force feed me sometimes. Yeah, Please just yeah, feed like me. Stick so that, uh, like, that's something I mean, foie gras, I mean, I, 
saw the other day you actually get uh, responsibly sourced for a grow hub. I wouldn't know how the fuck that works. Uh, so probably have to stick off the podcast. The, 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 the Dutch probably have to sign a form. It's probably like an indemnity form. So um, yeah, so it's uh, it's interesting though. You know, you know um, sadly though, we do live in a um, we do live in a world where it's cheaper. It's cheaper to go buy food at Steers or McDonald's um, than what it is to go do grocery shopping. But you know the world is always changing, so it's always the good and the bad, it's just ever evolving. But so I, it, will, it will come back we'll in the circle again. Even, it might not even come back, we might destroy ourselves before it comes back, but the point is it's like, hey, roll off the punches, things are going to change. Um, AI is coming, robots is coming, ah, deal with it. But you know, I remember when I was a little boy, one of my first food yeah, memories. You, you and I could have our perfect girlfriends by next year. <laughs> like a street one and a half. Yeah. And you could have three. <laughs> You just have to pay each one it's subscription it's every month. You probably drop coins yeah, there. You pay, you, you pay those monthly subscriptions. And we can swap yeah. them. Yeah. You can borrow yeah. them. Yeah. 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 But uh, with my, one of my first food memories, and I thought about this the other day, I don't know why, I think I saw something on a food channel or a YouTube video, was my mother, when I was, this was, we still lived in Bluefontein, so that was like preschool school, but I had this memory. She brought back a coconut. Okay. And for us, it was like, oh, I should let you this alien thing. Look at this thing, we've got this coconut. And now it's like, and it's not big enough, you know. And yeah. if you go on, you can get anything, wherever, whatever you want, and it's just all this info. And obviously, there was this probably financial boom in the world as well, and people could afford this stuff. And now it's just out there, and everybody knows about yeah. it. So people are not any press anymore. Um, so now, if you want to be a top chef, you have to really like, it's 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 a it's a different world, you know. It's not you don't have to go through the formal avenues anymore. Um, I mean, I know young young cooks uh, in and around town that are, you know, they're passionate. Uh, they chase ingredient. They they uh, um, they they do it in a completely different way. I mean, they 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 have what they call they go to pop up markets. Uh, they present their food there. You know, back in my day, it was like you either have a restaurant or you don't have a restaurant. No, in there is no in between. So like you either you're part you know, of the food you mafia. Either, or that, yeah, you're either Uncle Paolo uh, that has a fish and chips cafe um, that also sells ticks and play, along with fish and chips uh, in the background and, and drink a pop, um, or you have an actual restaurant with an actual menu and wine list and da 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 da. da. So you know the world the world has changed in that way, and, and, and that's why Cape Town. Um, because of its, when I say culture, I don't mean we are better than Johannesburg as an example, or Bloemfontein, or whatever the case may be. I think because of the density um, of Cape Town city area, um, it's basically a town. Yeah, you town. just you just bound to experience a vastness of creativity and, and culture, and you know people having these little unique. Ideas and they go out of their way to actually like uh, to 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 put it out there uh, because they want to they want to build something they want to experience something and they want to um, you sort of collaborate with like-minded uh, you know people you know we sitting here in a gallery um, and I can tell you I would know anything between fifty and a hundred uh, you know aspiring uh, young up-and-coming cooks. Uh, that would you give them that little corner, um, and they would bring their own little table, their own little stand, and they would bring their own ingredients, and they would and they'd make it work, and they'd bring an audience to actually come to try their uh, to try their, their cuisine. Um, and it's not that the cuisine has to stay constant. You know, we have the luxury now of trying. You know, we don't live in the day anymore of of where you know such and such makes the best lasagna. You know. Lasagna. You can Google, Google a recipe, get one on YouTube. You make yes, it. or you make your own version of uh, mm-hmm. lasagna. You know, I talk about these lovely people. I mean, do you know that we have, you can order a cauliflower crusted pizza? About it. I mean, yeah, they make like pizza based on cauliflower. Yes, do you know how much you burp and fart? After <laughs> I've never tried Yes, it's like cauliflower, but fuck it up. But do you know um, what we said here yeah, now? <coughs> just a squeak along with the year. Um, on this side of the road, you have a, a burger that costs 385 rand, and you walk across the street, and there's one for 
9500 and just uh, so, so it's also condensed in our inner city and the thing about Cape Town is we still have an inner city that's functioning. Yes. I don't, I don't think Johannesburg inner city is functioning. So not, not for the not for the cultural side, no. no not for the cultural side. For for this type of art because there's also art experience eating different stuff. Of course. Um, so this is a... The, and it's about social media and very posting unique. where you are, what you've gone to go experience and you know... Um, I think what we should do, you and I, using the proper English, um, I think we should go to a few places and record it and talk about food, do a few food reviews for phones. Yeah. That should be a good thing. Can do and I love all food. You know, I tell people, people are afraid to cook for me. Um, I never get invited to, to dinner parties. Um, that sucks, man. And, uh, and I'm like, but why? It's like, oh God, I'm too intimidated. I would never want to cook for you. Yeah. But you're not cooking for me. I mean, I can appreciate a, a, a person making a cheese and tomato sandwich. Yeah. Unless, well, not unless, as long as it's made with intent and, no and, and passion. No, fucking whatever. Whatever <laughs> floats your boat. But the, the, I think that's the most uh, horrid thing for a chef is that. Uh, um, we don't like eating our own food. And it's not because we don't like it, it's because you know what it tastes like already. So that surprise factor, that enjoyment of like, you know, I'm it's, not, cook for it, it's not necessarily the first bite, but it's just the entire dish in terms of volume, in terms of texture, in terms of the process that you're going through eating. You know, when you're cooking it yourself or when you've created that dish yourself, it's sort of like, you know, it's also it's about like uh, your if you if you walk up a mountain and down the other side and you get to a small village and somebody gives you a bowl of pea soup, food is not just the food; it's also the context. Exactly. So as so we eat it more like all, all rice. I, mean, I don't know what I can eat rice. I mean, you can give me foie gras and caviar all day, but I don't want to eat it with certain people. It's yeah. going to be horrible. I think my, my biggest, my, my worst decision would probably be you know like they say you're lost, you're on death row. What would I choose? I mean, that's and, and people ask that a lot. Like, I'll, I'll just take some food. That takes a very long time to so, eat. So like. right now, I probably go Burger King. <laughs> um, but uh, um, but yeah, it's uh, um, as I said, it's a, it's an interesting world. And, and uh, if you are, you know, the same as what uh, Cafe Ray says, not for everyone. Town is not uh, for everyone. You have to be. There are people that that find function and they find purpose in suburbia. Um, uh, be it either raising a family or knowing that your local grocer always has parking outside and I'm going to meet my best friend there because she also goes shopping there every day and da 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 um, you know, and the school ground is, is quite close you know, different strokes for different folks but uh, as I said, for me um, it's not that Cape Town CBD is the, the culture or the, uh, the uh, cuisine capital of, of South Africa um, I would probably think far from it but once you get down to the grassroots, um, <coughs> it really is, uh, it's interesting. Um, yeah. you know, even I like the idea that you get, it's just everything is close together. Yeah. Right now. I mean, you have Ethiopian, Ethiopian diners here. Yeah. I mean, the other day I had uh, um, an Ethiopian, I can't remember what they call it, but I mean, it's a crepe, it's a, it's a pancake. Um, massive dish. And then it's served with these, on, on top of it, it's served with these sort of like homemade cottage cheeses, but different flavors and then accent points of of like oil driven herb oil driven uh, uh things and it's, and it's absolutely crazy because it's something that i've never i've it's never experienced before you have zero expectation of what's coming like you're ordering from a menu you try to pronounce the name briefly try to read the description but you have but zero fucking idea what's coming your way so you know that that is a uh, that's a beautiful thing um, and then the other beautiful thing is also like, for instance, like with me, you know, I advertise a burger, but what you get is a very different version to what you perceive a burger is. Not that I'm trying to fuck you over or make it weird. It's it like deconstructing of, burgers. Yeah, so. I like, the reason why I like cooking burgers is because I'm, so in fine dining, I can't, you can pay for a meal. But so if I have, let's say, on a plate, whichever course it is, on a plate I have maybe, let's say, anything between four and five different components that are purposefully there. I can't go to the table and make you, firstly, 
show you in which sequence to eat it. But secondly, I also can't force you to eat all of them. So, I mean, this would happen a lot of times, for instance, at Sage, where, um, you know, people are obviously paying the money, you know, and, you know, spending massive amounts of money um, for me to cook for them. Um, but, uh, you know, you'd see uh, some plates coming back to the kitchen or the scullery and uh, be like, what the fuck? Like, so, let's say table four, and then you see the one plate, only half of the the ingredients were egg. Um, and, you're like, and I mean, it has happened on occasion where I've gone into the dining room and I'd be like, ask the waiter, take me to this person. And I'd be like, I'm sorry, like, what the fuck? Like, did you miss the memo? And they're like, what do you mean? And then, um, I think they're sort of like, still a little bit confused. I'm like, sorry, but who told you not to eat all of them? Uh, so why did you leave that or this? I mean, I don't understand. Did you not see the other people at your table? eating these? So how did you come about? Did you decide because it's green you don't eat it? Or did you choose to express that to the waiter or to me? Because you've literally fucked up my creation by not eating. <laughs> so whereas with a burger, um, so a burger uh, for me what's nice about it, it's not only about flavour, it's also about texture. So when I explain about eating things in a sequence, um, imagine Imagine it's something that everyone would understand. So let's say I, on a plate there's a schnitzel, be it pork or, or chicken or beef, um, so it's cracked, right? So there's, uh, there's schnitzel and let's say there is a mashed potato and there are, I don't know, green beans as an example. So um, what you could do, so what some people would do is they would eat either the schnitzel on its own but then they would only experience one flavor at a time with one texture or there are other people that would have for instance the mash with the schnitzel and they'd leave the vegetables to the end or they'd eat the vegetables first because they don't like the vegetables that much so that what to save the best for last so many permutations come along in terms of a burger the beauty of it is, is i can dictate not only what flavor profile you're getting but because of the way it dish in terms of the layering, I can also dictate what textures you will be experiencing in your mouth as you are eating it. Because, I mean, you really, if you want to be a, a dickhead, you can remove and swap around, but I mean, it's a lot of effort. So, in theory, my creation, I'm gently forcing it on you to experience, as an example, the mac and cheese within the, the, the offset of the of the sun-dried tomato uh, oil reduction, then the burger patty, then the wild rocket at the bottom. So I'm forcing you to have it in the way that I that I want you to experience it. And, and usually, and it's, and it's format, the simple format of a harmless burger, you can squish it with all this. And people have, think they have an understanding of what a burger is. So it's not weird, it's not wonderful, it's not different. If I tell you burger, you go, you're fucking cool, I like a burger. But the ingredients... That's, that's a standard go to. Yeah. Uh, the I don't know what they have are, Yeah, the ingredients. So even still now at Cafe Racer, when we ask, how would you like your patty done? So people go, people go like, sorry, what? Yeah, like, what are you talking about? Like, I'm like, how do you eat your meat? Your red meat? If they say, well done. Yeah, then it's sort of like, uh, okay, uh, yeah, it's going to take, it's gonna take <laughs> 20 minutes type of thing. But uh, um, yeah, uh, people are still sort of, Wow, by the not wildly confused by the fact that so I ask you like how do you eat your steak, yeah. red meat? So I just want to know how would I could then cook your 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 patty, and that's you know that's part of it. Uh, um, you know, part of the experience. Some people want juicy burgers. Some people want convenient burgers that you can walk and eat and whatever. Uh, some people want burgers that you know you'd have to be a circus act to be able to fit into your mouth. Um, and other people want small and compact things that is convenient for. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna give you a scenario quickly. Right. I had a bit of a chef experience. Okay. I had six weeks I worked in a, in a professional kitchen in Maui okay. instead of boss. Okay. And uh, it was really cool, but first of all, you have no life. So yes. it's like you, you work and you sleep, yeah. you take naps, and Sunday you recover from the week. 
Second of all, when I got my first paycheck, I said, what? I can't pay my little stupid little cottage and farm with this paycheck. And I said, no, sorry, man, I'm not doing this. It's not for me. So you, as a young man, you like, you have to be like a monk almost to be a chef, right? You have to weather these storms. Yeah, you have to go, look, you need to have a purpose. Um, so I always tell, I mean, even chefs that I've trained, um, you know, it's a, uh, I'll give the, not give, um, I'll present the opportunity to train you um, and to have you in my life for a per period of time. But I mean, that can't be your purpose. Yeah. So you would, as a, if you want to continue being a chef, you need to find your own, uh, I mean, you're not going to be satisfied working <coughs> with someone else cooking someone else's food for um, forever, irrespective of the budget, even if I were to pay you you know, five times, six times, ten times that amount. Um, you know, at the end of the day, you know, from a cooking point of view, you still need to be or want to be ambitious to go on and do your own thing and present your own type of palette to the um, to the world. Um, and uh, and that's the beautiful thing about chefs. You know, um, you know, uh, you don't cook the same thing forever, um, and you do. It's almost like an artist, you do reinvent yourself, you know, uh, every now and again. Um, and then people will still talk about this dish or that dish, and you remember that, and oh my god, that was my favorite. But, you know, that was 10 years ago, uh, type of thing. So, um, and I mean, I had that in, in situations with, with dishes uh, at my restaurants where um, it would almost be anarchy uh, if I were to dare remove that from, from a menu. Um, so yeah, that's the bad side of of serving the public, if you could call it that. Um, and uh, and then there's that thing going around of the customer's always right. Customer's never right, ever. Um, customer's never right because the customer's coming to you. Mm -hmm. So um, the customer comes to you for an experience. And, and you supply the experience. Yeah, so if I come to your house, you right. I'm not right because I'm coming to your house. There's a funny story about this, for some of us, because this is also like one of the famous chefs at some point, and uh, I, I won't mention his name, he's probably an old man by now, but there's a story going around, he was also like restaurant of the year or whatever, mm -hmm. starts with an R, and I just remember hearing the story that somebody, oh, I know well. yeah. somebody ordered the steak and they sent it back to the kitchen <laughs> to cook it more, and he came out and he threw it in front of them, yeah. he was so disgusted. That I wanted this other good steak. Yeah. Well, it is like that. You know, yeah. it's, um, um, you know uh, I think a chef, I mean, chef, cook, formal, not formal, would always go, I mean, any presentation of food, any version thereof, like I said, even a cheese and tomato sandwich, um, any presentation thereof is, uh, is made with, with intent and with passion. Yeah. Um, you put yourself into the Yes, and, and, and obviously, I mean, for me, um, not that I want to be hailed uh, for, for cooking good food or whatever the case might be uh, the whole time. I mean, I go to the, the lady in Kailicha and I eat her what they call Maguilia, which is what in Afrikaans you would call fed cook. Um, and uh, <coughs> you know, she's sitting at a little gas stove and she's got a pot and an oil and, you know, she's got a, a dough base and she rolls it and plop, 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 plop. Um, but the intent is still that I'm giving you, you know, good food from a personal space and, uh, and that I want you to enjoy it. Um, so, you know, I can understand perfectly from, from any chef or even a cook's point of view, if you are ordering, I'm not going to come to your house and go, listen, you know, Chris, can you just, uh, can you cook? Uh, what I want. Can you, no, but can you cook it some more? Do you mind if I just pop it in the microwave for like five minutes just to nuke it? Yeah. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's rude and it's, uh, um, you I know. I think it's rude because it's your, it's your creation and I have yeah. to respect it. I'm coming into well, your domain. Like something else, man. I'm, Come coming, I'm coming in your domain you know. and I'm here to pay you for giving me this experience yes. and I'm telling you, you know, I don't want to have it. I mean, I used to have a situation, I mean, and, and a lot of my, my peers uh, had, and I mean, I know Baptist uh, Basson very well, um, and uh, I mean, we haven't always sat around the same fireplace, 
Um, Ruben Riffle, I know a little bit less, um, which I think is the R that you wanted to speak about. Yes, I see um, different R. Okay, I'll do it afterwards. R. Okay. <laughs> um, but, uh, um, and I know Michael uh, from Tewa. Um I think Michael has moved on to a a hamburger sort of type stand, um, but he actually grows the actual cattle um, called Stud. Um, but as I said, these things are it's passionate and purposeful driven, um, and and I could come around and go like, oh, you know, like the roll versus the burger patty. It's like, you know, it's not really, and and that's where that ego part comes from. I mean, like me running a kitchen, what you would call a pass which is the dishing table, if you could call it that. So I would have myself and maybe a sous chef and would run the pass. Now you must remember, first course, second course, third course, fourth course, up to six. And I have to gauge, just like running a symphony or orchestra, but, you know, who had what at what time. You know, so I can't send out, if you were to, uh, you just, you had entrees just now, I can't send out, the next plate of food or the next course two minutes later. So it really becomes like, like running an uh, orchestra. A, a orchestra. So, um, and, and all that is, it is desired at the end of the day is for the person and or persons to, it doesn't have to be an establishment, but to leave with a, a heartfelt experience. Yeah. Uh, that someone had They're actually, buying that experience. Yes, yeah, that someone had actually made time. And if I, if I had the, the, the notion and or the, um, the time and ability to do it, I'd probably want to, to make my sculler that washes the dishes the hero of the story as well, because it's the same, it's a tea. It's the same thing that, that, that goes in there. And many of my, my chefs and, and or even sommeliers uh, that I've trained in the years, um, most of them have come from, from my scullery sections. Uh, because you first come in, like I did, like I explained earlier, you know, peeling vegetables and prepping vegetables, come in on grassroots, and if you are not, you should be, but if you are keen to want to learn more, then we go step by step by step by step by step. And uh, <coughs> um, I mean, uh, um, yeah, I mean, there are a few chefs out there that are doing amazing for themselves, and, and, and I was only happy to be. Uh, you know, a tiny little uh, speck of their journey as there were shifts in my life that, you know, influenced it uh, that way. But, it, it, you know, it comes down to the, to the fundamental basis uh, of, you know, if you and I go to a rural stand, uh, it doesn't really matter if the role is made by you or you get it from a special place or you get it from a um, you get your brew horse made by such and such, or you make the brew horse yourself, or you make the sauce yourself. A simple thing of a brew horse roll that we, you and I would probably expect to pay, I don't know, 50, 60 rand for. The amount of passion compared to my 600 rand or 650 rand dish, very similar. But it's yeah. a different like environment. Yeah. So. Um, you know, and, and uh, all we want is for for people to to enjoy it, and, and nothing is permanent. Yeah. Um, you know, it's not really about the red and the sin. It's more no. about the experience of your life as you go through it. I want to tell you the story. I love Malawi, especially in, in the winter because it's sun. But the restaurant in Malawi is like this. It's a, if you walk into this little building, the ceilings are hanging off like this, and there's hardly any, the walls are falling apart, it looks like a shack. Yeah. But you sit there, but that, that lady that brings you that food, is, it's wonderful food. Yeah. She's, if you get over your preconceptions of the surroundings, of she's been cooking that meat for hours and hours since early morning because yeah. the meat is pretty tough. And I try to cook their meat, I sell the small villages, it's impossible. Shack, fuck you. And she brings us food to you and you eat it with the simo, and you eat the meat and the basic vegetables is wow. She is good at what she does. Yes. And with this passion, this intent. And that's what she does her whole life, she does yeah. that. And uh, you know, that's a, a unique and wonderful experience. You just need to open yourself up to it. But that, like everything in life is an experience, food, whatever you do. Yeah. And I think we, we, we forget that it. it's not a, we're not a part of a machine, 
we, we experiencing our unique lives and then we die. Yeah. But I want to get back to... We go back to the source and then we what, go back again. I don't know what that means. Yeah. Maybe yeah. we go on a wonderful journey. No, we go back to the light and then we decide when we want to return <laughs> again. Because it's all about life, it's about experience. Yeah, I think um, so. Yeah. You know, and uh, um, yin and yang, good and bad. It's all the know, same thing. Man. It has to come in those ways. Um, so, uh, um, and, and the same, you know, when it comes to with food, you have to have shit food to appreciate good food Ooh. as well. And uh, um, shit food. And you have to go, go hungry for a while. Yeah, shit food is, uh, you know, I've, I, I've been through times where I appreciate, uh, um, I look at yum yum peanut butter and I go, holy shit, look at that price. And then I like look at the, the checkers brand and I'm like, Okay, I'll take that one. For yes, now. But I mean, you know, uh, you know, even a thing like uh, like peanut butter. I mean, if you look, if you if you take it out of its packaging and its context, if I were to, if there was no such thing as peanut butter on the planet, um, or no one really knows about it, it's not really mainstream or whatever. And I were to present it as a puree on a dish, <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, uh, Indonesian cuisine, I think, do it in. in in terms of uh, um, where they, they use uh, peanut based sauce, uh, I think it's saute, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so it's a peanut based sauce that they base uh, meat and, and, and things like that with. Um, and uh, um, But if it wasn't mainstream, I mean, I would make a peanut butter puree and I'd put it on a plate in a fine dining environment and you go, like, what the? F I mean, more than likely, I'd probably <coughs> still do it. Take it out of the yum yum peanut butter jar, present it beautifully <laughs> on the plate, and you like a holy shit like that with that steak. Just put like, a little leaf on it. Yeah, it was like amazing. Yeah. Um, and uh, um, so coming back, I mean, like the Malawi uh, woman that you spoke of. I mean, when I was in Kalicha, building the community center, I used to take the the, the kids. Uh, we call them bry shacks. Um, and ironically, it's the weirdest thing. So the bry shacks are all owned and run by women. Um, and uh, and that weirdly enough, they all cook the same meat with the same sausage, with the same basting sauce, on the same braai, all one next to each other. And so what you have to do is that uh, that's all they sell. So but you want bread with it. So before you go there, you have to stop in that shop right or wherever, and you have to buy like one or two loaves of sliced bread. Um, and, uh, and then you have to buy cool drink because they also don't sell cool drink. But yet everyone inside eats bread with the meat and or cool drink. So, and I mean, the girls used to, you know, they loved me there because I mean, I'd bring the kids and the kids are happy and, you know, we'd all have a fun time, you know, sharing. You know, I used to give them money and say, look, put together whatever you want to, to put together. And then we'd all, we'd all have fun. So I said to the one lady one day, but I don't, I mean, you all sell the same thing the same product at the same price in the same location like there's no distinction no, no. Um, and, uh, and she said no but this, you know, this is what people want and I agree that is what people want I said but your clients so they, they come all of them come with bread sliced bread um, and they all come with coupon which I think is Twizzer or something like that or like a jive or whatever the case may be and you have to buy cups so ShopRite makes a fucking killing because you have to bring cups the whole time and then you buy the, um, you buy the cool drink but, uh, um, and everyone would have it uh, inside. And I said to the, the, the lady, but I mean, why don't you sell the bread and or the cool drink? And she said, ah, it's not my business. But I mean, you know, the, the, um, the beautiful th also thing there with the hospitality. So what they would do from their culture, um, so she would have like a what we would call an emma, uh, like a shallow uh, bucket, um, and it would have a version of washing powder and or sunlight, very likely in, in warm water. And before you, before they bring the meat um, to the table, she comes around and you can you wash your hands first. But you're sitting in the shack, so you know, like you say, you can just remove your mental blockage the from, conditions, but yes. you know it's made and, and the intent of the whole experience it's is a great with, experience with such passion 
that uh, you cannot duplicate it. Uh, it. Yeah. It won't be the same if you go to a London restaurant, it's just a different yeah. experience. But I want to say something about that. The first thought, you, if you come up from a capitalist point of view, and that's not my business, you think, oh, that's a missed opportunity. But there's something very much to be said for a culture that gives everybody their little bit. Yeah. Uh, we she are, understands that shop life needs to. They do their little thing and they make a little bit, I make my little bit. And that's how a lot of people in the small place all get to survive. Yeah. You come from a capitalist Western point of view, okay, everybody must make as much as I can and fuck the other people. Yes, take over everything. Take over everything, yeah. but I love that because that's why I love Africa. Yeah. It's like everybody's allowed to live. Yeah. Uh, everybody must make their little bit. And nobody's very rich, nobody's very poor or whatever, but uh, we love as a community. But I mean, I spoke to, I spoke to the, the, the French girl that I was telling you earlier, Maggie, um, about, I mean, we were talking yesterday about uh, um, and please, for whoever's watching, I'm not saying that Europe is bad or the, whatever. The know. 10 people is watching. Um, yeah, well, I love the 10 people. I love all capitalism. It's also good, I'm just saying so, it's different. But, um, you know, she was uh, um, one of the, the, the girls that worked with me were asking, like, oh my god, you know, why are you here in, in Africa if you're from France? You know, it's from, and from Paris. And she was like, uh, I mean, I, I didn't say much. In, uh, she was like, you don't understand like uh, the freedom that you have here yeah. compared to, to there. Um, and uh, so we got chatting a little bit later on uh, yesterday, and um, and she was saying to me, you know, I mean, and I know a lot of these things. I mean, that's why you know I don't live in Europe, but uh, and it is for some people. But you, you know, everything is is structured and licensed, and you know, you need a certification, you need a uh, a, a license or a membership or, a, or this and you need to apply for, for everything where is in, in, in Africa um, you and I can still it's almost like you know the scale of the opposite you know I can take you to the, the finest restaurant in, in this area of Cape Town uh, for a dining experience and in the same area I can take you to like a, a liver shop or oh, chipper, uh, chipper off chipper. Chipper too much. Exactly, with this, this amazing seasoning that is unique to this place or the roll or whatever the case might be or the way they cook their, their, their chip rolls and the experience is, and you know, she was saying to me, you know, like, you know, you take the, 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 the train and they've again increased the prices now, you know, it used to be uh, one, one euro ninety, now it's two euro ten um, and then you come here and you look at two euro ten, and you could you could eat uh, not necessarily the fanciest foods or, or whatever the case may be, but you could wholesomely fill your belly and live a life and meet people and, and whatever the case may be for the same as what a train ride would be uh, from one stop to the next in uh, in Europe. So um, I think the the for me the it's, it, I'm blessed that we are here. Um, I think someday in the future, my my uh, my destination would probably. I've always wanted, for some reason, want to go to South America, not necessarily the northern sides, uh, meaning Brazil, Uruguay, Argentina, but more to the lower, like a Peru, uh, even Uruguay, uh, you know, these type of places, um, because I think there you would find these genuine, sort of almost un, untouched traditions. Yeah. Uh, that, uh, it's a kind of a strange innocence in it. Yeah. I mean, uh, we've got so... No, it's almost like chocolate, like, like you, like you experience like, a chocolate for the first time. Or like, like simplicity. You know, when yeah. I was in Malawi last, um, I mean, I traveled no budget, but it's the best way to travel because you're kind of vulnerable and that makes you open. Yes. So you have to engage, you have, you to, have to engage. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, I would sleep in a local guest house, it's 50 rand a night and it's just a little mattress and a thing, I love it. Yeah. But I'm uh, so disappointed, somebody told me, listen, they, you see the guys fishing in the lake and they're drawing in the nets. So you can rock up there and you don't have money, you don't have food, but if you help them draw in the net, you'll get your bit of fish. Yeah. And, you, and so, somebody will cook it for you, whatever. Yeah. Or so, they invite you back and they say, listen, come, we're cooking. Yeah. And so we still have that, you can still fall between the cracks kind of thing, so love. And I think uh, more Western European things, it's like you're either like homeless and smoking fucking crack in the street and living in a tent, 
Oh, you have a normal, you get a normal life. You're not allowed to do that anymore. <laughs> yeah. But yes, I They'll guess. They'll you will crack and put it up <laughs> in the but you die faster. Because oh. I don't want you on the street. So it's like very black and white, and I like that colorful, all the spectrum of colors now. Yeah, well, you can, you know. And I mean, life is not so much. It's like, uh, we can go from oh. here, we can go to the fanciest hotel, oh. you know, and go yeah, and it's, all good. it's all good. You know, I love it all. Away, it's I was like in this fancy hotel, the art exhibition the other day, it was beautiful, it was lovely. And yesterday I went into another place and bought a tip roller, it was also beautiful. Exactly. But uh, it doesn't have to exclude each other. But let's get back to you, and we kind of gently. Close this podcast down because I still have to do things. You are also a busy man. Let's get I back have to, to you. Walk around after all this beer. No, you don't have to go. I used to hate fucking wine tasting in the mornings. <laughs> so every wine farm wants to be on your wine list, and they, you know, they make appointments. And I got to a point of where I, I would schedule, I'd schedule wine tastings before ten o'clock because it gives me time to sober up before dinner service. Like I can still work. <laughs> through lunch service. That's your job, man. Yeah. yeah, and it's horrible because like, you know, these amazing Stellenbosch wine estates, um, again, a lot of passion, a lot of intent. And, 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 <coughs> um, so you want to give them their, their credit and you don't want to make a fuck up on your, on your wine list. Um, you know, at, uh, at my last restaurant, uh, or my last fine dining restaurant, we had 240 Stellenbosch wines available all by glass, including champagne. All by glass? Yeah. No, no, you could. I mean, you could order a bottle, but all available by, by glass. So you can imagine running. So it doesn't become a conversation um, or it doesn't become a menu uh, item. I mean, my son and Leo, um, that, uh, and I mean, I love him to pieces, Justin Janja. Um, he, uh, he arrived by me as a sort of a, a, a fine uh, construction worker. And I asked him, so how the fuck did you end up here? And he's like, no, I was fired from the last job. And I said, what was it? And he said, no, construction. I said, what went wrong? And he said, he fell off a ladder. <laughs> so, um, and then I trained him how to be a barista first. And he was very passionate about barista. And, uh, and then uh, um, really started going at the wine list. And, uh, and I said to him, look, you either going to learn uh, and I'll send you to school um, at the Cape Wine Academy um, to become a sommelier or um, you're going to remain a barista, which is not a bad thing, but you'll remain a barista for forever. And uh, it started with, you know, he's a Christian, he doesn't drink. And uh, I said, well, you know, you can spit out, you know, you're just tasting this. So, uh, but long story, I mean, this was... A well, they gave of, him that opportunity. Yeah, a number of years ago. And Justin is an amazing uh, and accomplished uh, sommelier today. Um, and, uh, does he spit out or does he drink now? No, he drinks now. Um, I think he's still Christian, but, uh, but he drinks now. And, uh, and, and he would single-handedly manage um, all of those, uh, all of that, that bottle service. Um, so pairing it with my dishes. So going around from client to client and almost, not insisting, but very firmly gesturing. You having this, 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 I'll pair this, 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 this. This, this, this. Because he knows what he's talking yeah, about. Yeah, and he knows what bottles are in circulation and what would be paid well with, uh, with what dishes. So, so that falling off the ladder was the best thing that ever <laughs> did. It was. It, was probably, it probably hurt like a motherfucker. But yeah, I, but I... But uh, yeah. If so, you went a step up after yeah, that. So, um, so yeah, I mean, that's the beautiful side. Of yeah, that. but that's cool because, I mean, that's what it's all about. But I want to get back to... Your, we haven't talked about this, like you were chef of the year at some point, uh, then yeah. randomly some, yeah, so what was that all about? How did that happen? And uh, I mean, again, how did again, your life change? Ego, you know, chasing ego. So, uh, um, yeah, chef of the year, uh, 1999, which uh, shows my age, um, as you can see. It's after the bull war. For the hell, <laughs> yeah, it's like with that, with the, with the ox wagon. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and and yeah, it's, uh, I think I mean it, it was a it was a great honour in terms of uh, um, in terms of the South African Chefs, uh, Chefs Association, but uh, it gives you that drive and that that it it, op- it opens doors that you would never have imagined, and then all you have to do is is, is apply your talents, and and I think why I don't focus that much on 
on uh, on my journey and this journey, whatever, is is for the fact that if I look at it in real time today, you know, going to a little place an observatory, um, you know, there's a. I mean, I'll give you an example of uh, <coughs> uh, African ice cream. Um, in, uh, in Obs, and it's the most obscure little, it's literally like a little alleyway that's got like a metal gate in front of it. And I mean, if you were to drive past, and that's the thing with Cape Town, you'd almost want to commute in Cape Town on foot, because you'd be able to take in from architecture to culture to experience to smells to, to all of these sort of Yeah. Um, if you were to drive past, you wouldn't see it. Um, and so this, this guy, um, he, he was sort of nudged in the in the direction, um, and uh, and he makes a gelato ice cream and he pairs it with uh, with African fruit, um, you know, like your marulas and, and, and different types of berries and things like that. But it is, it like I said again, if you were to drive, <coughs> um, you wouldn't see it, which is the yeah. like the good or the sad thing about it is, and <coughs> so I'm very I'm very blessed in terms of the doors opening for me, and and I think for the for the time, um, it served its purpose um, of having those doors open, and it also showed me that uh, that I don't um, I don't really belong in the commercial cooking side. Um, you know, looking at what what we do in here right now. Back in the day, I mean, you probably you'd research it uh, 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 probably at some point. So back in the day when ETV. This, this even shows my age further. So when ETV started, I think, I think ETV, ETV was only available like three or four hours a day. And uh, otherwise I'm not going to be any good to any, any person later. Um, ETV was like on air three or four hours a day. And then it sort of like went a little bit. I think they did the porn, the soft porn late at night. I think it was oh, he's in, in, in manual, like everyone has to be home by 12 or 11. Um, and, uh, um, and then uh, years later, a few years later, they, uh, um, they did a, um, uh, what's that, a uh, breakfast show. They started with a breakfast show. And it was called the Toasty Show, like the actual like, toast yeah, bread toast. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and I was the resident sort of chef there for, uh, um, on there. Fucking, and that was, it, I mean, it was an experience, but it was insane. So I can't remember the actual, I mean, some of them are really well-known comedians uh, now, but so the whole, the, the presenters were made, up, uh, were made up of three or four up-and-coming comedians, of which one I think was quite well-known uh, at the time. Um, and, uh, and then the three were the sort of the younger ones, and they were the presenters. Um, and then we end up in, I think it was in Lovo, um, that was where the filming studio was, and you'd have to be there at fucking 4 a.m. in the morning. Um, and my segment of the cooking was like right at the end. So the show would run from 6 to 8 in the morning, like the toasting show. And I think it was only Monday to Friday. Um, and, uh, um, and then my segment would be the last 10 minutes of the actual show. So I'm there from four o'clock in the fucking morning, chatting, having makeup done, blah 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 blah, and all the other guests in between, and then up the last ten minutes of the of the show. So um, yeah, as I said, it uh, it it was a, a great variety of experiences, mm. um, and uh, um, yeah, it makes up uh, it makes up life. It was life. Yeah. Listen, man, I think we're going to close it down because uh, it's been a while talking for a while and I want to say thank you for coming and uh, for if you're still here you're still listening please just subscribe that will be cool that will help my channel and my mission to bring stories to people and uh, I'll see you on the flip side on the next time and uh, if you're into burgers right burgers is your thing though. burgers is my thing burgers burgers come to the cafe racer cap down in Frieda uh, yeah, Friedenberg Lane. Friedenberg Lane is just, just off Long Street. So it's a great place to go for a little yeah. burger and then you go out into Long Street and party a little bit. A little crunch burger for yeah. the menu. Come to Cape Town, it's a great place. Have an adventure. <laughs>
Cheers. See you next time.